four paces to the rear. Push. That's on you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome on this auspicious day, I guess I have to say. I'm pleased to see so many people out here, and uh, we will do our best to make the best of this situation as we have it. Just one thing, to, by way of explanation, we chose to march without muskets today because we've been told that muskets can be lightning rods in the case of uh, uh, foul weather. So we chose to take the safe side. So we're here with our natural born arms and we'll proceed by that way. I want to say a little bit about the unit that we represent. We have some uh, friends here as well, but the bulk of our, our unit is the 11th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, which was formed in and around Williamsport, West Branch, etc. Two of the companies were from originally from Williamsport, and uh, there were companies from Lock Haven, Danville, Muncie, Company G, etc. Uh, and along with the units that were were mustered in. On April of 1861 was a 16-piece band under the leadership of Daniel Repaz. And you may or may not have heard of the Repaz band, but it still exists. So I guess we have to say that part of the 11th Pennsylvania is still in existence today. At this point, I would like to introduce our new chaplain for this year. Uh, Ch chaplain John Lee has uh, had problems with his wife and was not able to be here, so he invited Nancy Hale, and I'm going to turn to her and ask her for the invocation. Nancy. Brothers and friends, let us pray. Supreme ruler of the universe, God of battles and of peace, we thank thee for this day and hour, for this blessed privilege of meeting here to do homage to our nation's dead. We thank thee that in the day of trouble and the hour of danger, thou in thy infinite wisdom raised up men who were ready to do battle and if need be to die that this country might be preserved. Grant, we beseech thee, a continuance of thy watchful care. Grant thy blessing upon these sacred ceremonies, consecrated as they are to the memory of brave and loyal hearts who dared stand for the right and did not fear to bear their breasts to a storm of steel in defense of human liberty, a united country, and the brotherhood of man. Bless our country preserve its integrity. Make it, we pray thee, an instrument in thy hands of great good. Hear and answer, we beseech thee. Amen. Thank you. If you've been to one of these occasions before, you know that it's an audience participation exercise. And one of the ways we participate is by singing almost forgotten songs. How many of you remember my country, tis of thee? Okay, well, let's let's do that. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, uh, I should have mentioned that we were taking the ritual from the Grand Army of the Republic, which was prescribed in. 1868 by John A. Logan, when this was called Decoration Day, and we've uh, also uh, we've 
kept that uh, uh, ritual for the end of the ceremony. So, my country, tis of the sweet land of liberty, of the I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims pine, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. At this point, Chaplain Hale has some remarks to bring to us, and so I will turn the microphone over to her. In his book, Regimental Losses in the American Civil War, William Fox writes this. It will doubtless be a surprise to many to note the number of chaplains who were killed in battle. These gallant members of the church militant were frequently seen in the thickest of the fight, some of them handling a rifle with skill. Some, unarmed, would move about among their men encouraging them to do their best. During the American Civil War, 11 Union chaplains were killed, either in battle or as a result of wounds that they received during the performance of their duty. And this morning, I would like to share the story of a particular chaplain whose love for his country and for the men of his regiment, whose unwavering faith and whose great sense of duty compelled him to go beyond what was expected of him and to go where he had no obligation to go. Chaplain Arthur Buckminster Fuller was born on August 10, 1822 in Massachusetts. He was ordained as a Unitarian minister and served churches in the Boston area <coughs> until he resigned his pastorate in July 1861 to enlist as a chaplain of the 16th Massachusetts Infantry. Although most chaplains would choose to stay near the rear during battle so that they would be ready to care for the wounded as the men fell back from the line, Fuller believed that it was his duty to stay with the men in the line of battle. For nine days during the Peninsula Campaign, he lived on crackers and coffee and very little sleep while ministering to the men in his regiment. But the rigors of the campaign compromised his health his body could no longer keep up with his spirit, and his sickness became so severe that against his will, the surgeon sent him home to recuperate. Throughout the summer of 1862, he struggled, and he lingered near death more than once, but he finally recovered enough that he felt compelled to return to his regiment that October. Once he arrived in camp, he wrote home to his family how warm the greeting, both upon the part of officers and men. It touched my heart. It was right that I came back. He spent time caring for sick and wounded soldiers in the field hospitals. But when his regiment was sent forth to go to Falmouth on the Rappahannock River, surgeons felt that Fuller was still too weak to join them. So he wrote home again. You can hardly realize the pain I felt when I found I could not share the field campaign without throwing away my own health and life. I love the regiment, and I believe their feeling toward me to be so cordial that I am always reluctant to sever the ties. In December 1862, Fuller was offered a commission as a chaplain at a field hospital, a regular army hospital near Washington meaning that he could finally leave the battlefield and have a chance to regain his health. But first he had to resign his position as chaplain. On December 7th, his regiment was drawn up for the purpose of sharing a final religious service with their beloved chaplain. And he expressed great regret at having to leave them. On December 9th, he wrote a final letter home. For nearly a year and a half, I have been constantly with my regiment except for an accent for sickness. And I have learned to regard its noble officers and brave soldiers as brothers, and its camp as my home. 
second only in affection to my own domestic household. On December 10th, his resignation was accepted and he received an honorable discharge from the Army service. But the very next day, Fuller learned that a battle at Fredericksburg was imminent. And instead of returning to Washington immediately to accept his new assignment, he chose to stay with the regiment because he knew that he did not need any commission from any army in order to minister to his beloved brothers in the regiment. The army had to cross the Rappahannock River to attack the Confederates who were ensconced in Fredericksburg, but the pontoon bridges had not yet arrived. And so a call went out for volunteers to cross the river in boats. And when Fuller learned that members of his own regiment were going to go across the river, he decided to join them, even though he had no obligation to do so. Even though he had been reminded that since he had been discharged from the army, that if he fell, he would, uh, his family would not receive a pension, he picked up a musket, he climbed into the boat, and he went across the river. Soon after entering the city, he took a position and after firing a round or two, he was hit by two bullets. He fell there in the street and died instantly. The men in this detail had received orders to pull back and they had to leave the chaplain's body where it was. But an hour later, when the men were finally able to return to that place, they found that Fuller had been stripped of his clothing and robbed of the few valuable possessions that he had with him that he planned to take home. He was 40 years old. In a letter sent to Fuller's brother, one of the captains of the 16th Massachusetts provided this testimony. We had been in Fredericksburg but a few minutes when Chapter Ful Chaplain Fuller accosted me with the usual military salute. He had a musket in his hand and said, Captain, I must do something for my country. What shall I do? At his funeral services in Boston, one speaker called Fuller's choices an act of generous emotion, of noble heroism, of self-sacrificing patriotism. And another speaker proclaimed that Fuller offered his life to inspire the army with noble purpose and, if need be, to inspire the nation. This is what we are charged to remember on this day this sacrificial sense of duty and love for nation and for comrades. May we all be inspired by people like Chaplain Arthur Fuller, who gave all they had in service to God and their country's cause. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chaplain. Now we'll continue the audience participation part by singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You should know this one. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Attention, company. Present, horn. Commence firing!
Order. Hold. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the formal part of the ceremony. Now, once again, we ask for your participation. If you're able, we ask you to pick up some flowers and decorate the soldiers' graves down here. Uh, as many of you have been doing. Once again, thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. Come in.